Mr. Tennant. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I'm not going to be able to get this done in 10 minutes, and we'll try and be as fast as I can, but we have a lot we have to say, okay. and we'll be as quickly as quick as we can, and I thank you for your indulgence in that regard. I welcome the opportunity to be here today to be part of an inquiry that is vital to all Americans. On September the 11th, nearly 3,000 innocent lives were taken in brutal acts of terror. For the men and women of American intelligence, the grief we feel, the grief we share with so many others, is only deepened by the knowledge of how hard we tried without success to prevent this attack. It is important for the American people to understand what CIA and the intelligence community were doing to try to prevent the attack that occurred and to stop future attacks, which Al-Qaeda has certainly planned and remains determined to attempt. What I want to do this morning as explicitly as I can is to describe the war we have waged for years against Al-Qaeda, the level of effort, the planning, the focus, and the enormous courage and discipline shown by our officers throughout the world. It is important for the American people to understand how knowledge of the enemy translated into action around the globe, including the terrorist sanctuary of Afghanistan before September the 11th. It is important to put our level of effort into context, to understand the trade-offs and resources and people we, and we had to make the choices we consciously made to ensure that we maintained an aggressive counterterrorism effort. We need to understand that in the field of intelligence, long-term erosions of resources cannot be undone quickly when emergencies arise. And we need to explain the difference that sustained investments in intelligence, particularly in people, will mean for our country's future. We need to be honest about the fact that our homeland is very difficult to protect for strategic warning to be effective, there must be a dedicated program to address the vulnerabilities of our free and open society. Successive administrations, commissions, and the Congress have struggled with this. To me, it's not a question of surrendering liberty for security, but of finding a formula that gives us the security we need to defend the liberty that we treasure. Not simply to, to defend it in a time of peace, but to preserve it in a time of war, a war in which we must be ready to play offense and defense simultaneously. That is why we must arrive soon at a national consensus on homeland security. We need to be honest about our shortcomings and tell you what we have done to improve our performance in the future. There have been thousands of actions in this war, an intensely human endeavor, not all of which have been executed flawlessly. Nevertheless, the record will show a keen awareness of the threat, a disciplined focus and persistent efforts to track, disrupt, apprehend, and ultimately try to bring to justice bin Laden and his lieutenants. Somehow lost in much of the debate since September 11th is one unassailable fact. The U.S. intelligence community could not have surged as it has in the conflict in Afghanistan and engaged in an unprecedented level of operations around the world, if it were as mired as some have portrayed. It is important for the American people to know that despite the enormous successes we've had in the past year, indeed over many years, Al-Qaeda continues to plan and will attempt more deadly strikes against us. There will be more battles won and sadly more battles lost. We must be honest about that too. Finally, we need to focus on the future and consider how the knowledge we have gained this year will be applied. Let me begin by describing the rise of Osama bin Laden and the intelligence community's response. We recognized early on the threat posed by him and his supporters. As that threat developed, we tracked it, we reported it to the executive branch policymakers, Congress, and when feasible, directly to the American people. We reacted to the growing threat by conducting energetic, innovative, and increasingly risky operations to combat it. We went on the offensive. And this, is, and this effort mattered. It saved lives, perhaps in the thousands, and it prepared the field for the rapid success in Afghanistan last winter. The first rule of warfare is know your enemy. 
My full statement documents our knowledge and analysis of bin Laden from his early years as a terrorist financier to his leadership of a worldwide network based in Afghanistan. But suffice it to say that as bin Laden's prominence grew in the early 1990s, it became clear to CIA that it was simply not enough to collect and report intelligence about him. As early as 1993, our units watching him began to propose action to reduce his organization's capabilities. I must pause here. In an open forum, I cannot describe what authorities we sought or received, but it is important that the American people understand two things. The first is about covert action in general. CIA can only pursue such activities with the express authorization of the President. The second point is that when such proposals are considered, it is always because we or policymakers identify a threatening situation, a situation to which we must pay far greater attention, and one in which we must run far greater risks. As long ago as 1993, we saw such a situation with Osama bin Laden. By the time bin Laden left Sudan in 1996 and relocated himself and his terror network to Afghanistan, the intelligence community was taking action to stop him. We established a special unit known as the Bin Laden Issue Station with CIA, NSA, FBI, and other officers specifically to get more and more actionable intelligence on Bin Laden and his organization. We took this step because we knew the traditional approaches alone would not be enough for this target. We monitored his whereabouts increased our knowledge about him and his organization with information from our own assets and from many foreign intelligence services. We were working hard on a program to disrupt his finances, degrade his ability to engage in terrorism, and ultimately to bring him to justice. We must remember that despite the heightened attention, bin Laden was in the mid-1990s one of four areas of concentration within our counterterrorism center. That concentration included Hezbollah, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, al gamat the Palestinian rejectionists, and smaller groups around the world. Once bin Laden found safe haven in Afghanistan, he defined himself publicly as a threat to the United States. While we often talk of two trends in terrorism, state-supported and independent, in bin Laden's case with the Taliban, we had something completely new, a terrorist supporting a state. What bin Laden created in Afghanistan was as sophisticated an adversary as good as any that we have ever operated against. As the intelligence community improved its understanding of the threat, and as the threat grew, we refocused and intensified our efforts to track, disrupt, and bring these terrorists to justice. By 1998, the key elements of our strategy against bin Laden and al-Qaeda inside Afghanistan and globally placed us in a strongly offensive posture. They included hitting al-Qaeda's infrastructure, working with our foreign partners to carry out arrests, disrupting and weakening his finances, recruiting or exposing operatives, pursuing a multi-track approach to bring bin Laden himself to justice, working with foreign services, developing a close relationship with U.S. federal prosecutors, increasing pressure on the Taliban, and are enhancing our capability to capture him. Our 1998 budget submission to the Congress, which was prepared in early 1997, outlined our counterterrorism center's offensive operations, listing as their goals to render the masterminds, disrupt terrorist infrastructure, infiltrate terrorist groups, and work with foreign partners. It highlighted efforts to work with the FBI, in a bold program to destroy the infrastructure of major terrorist groups worldwide. In each subsequent year, we delivered to you equally emphatic statements of our intent. Despite these clear intentions and the daring activities that went with him, I was not satisfied that we were doing all we could against this target. In 1998, I told key leaders at CIA and across the intelligence community that we should consider ourselves at war with Osama bin Laden. I ordered that no effort or resource be spared in prosecuting this war. In early 1999, I ordered a baseline review of CIA's operational strategy against bin Laden. In spring of 1999, we produced a new comprehensive operational plan of attack against him and al-Qaeda inside 
and outside of Afghanistan. The strategy was previewed to senior CIA management by the end of July 1999. By mid-September, it had been briefed to the CIA, operational-level personnel, to NSA, to the FBI, and other partners. CIA began to put in place the elements of this operational strategy, which structured the agency's counterterrorism activity until September 11th of 2001. This strategy, which we call the plan, built on what our counterterrorism center was recognized as doing well. Collection, quick reaction to operational opportunities, renditions, disruptions, and analysis. Its priority was plain, to capture and bring bin Laden and his principal lieutenants to justice. The plan included a strong and focused intelligence collection program to track and act against bin Laden and his associates in terrorist sanctuaries. It was a blend of aggressive human source collection, both unilateral and with foreign partners, and enhanced technical collection. To execute the plan... Mr. Tenet, uh, 10 minutes. If you want to proceed... I'd like to, sir. To execute the plan, CTC developed a program to select and train the right officers and put them in the right places. We moved talented and experienced operations officers into the center. We initiated a nationwide program to identify, vet, and hire qualified personnel for counterterrorism assignments in hostile environments. <coughs> we sought native fluency in the languages of Middle, Middle East and South Asia, combined with police, military, business, technical, or academic expertise. In addition, we established an eight-week advanced counterterrorism operations course to share the tradecraft we had developed and refined over the years. The parts of the plan focused on Afghanistan face some daunting impediments. U.S. policy stopped short of replacing the Taliban regime. U.S. relations with Pakistan, the principal, one of the principal access points, were strained by the Pakistani nuclear tests and the military coup in 1999. Despite these facts, our surge in collection and operations paid off. Our human intelligence reporting grew. Our human intelligence sources against terrorism grew by more than 50 percent between 1999 and 9-11. Working across agencies, and in some cases with foreign services, we designed and built several <coughs> collection systems for specific use against al-Qaeda inside Afghanistan. By 9-11, a map would show that these collection programs and human networks were in place in such numbers as to nearly cover Afghanistan. Mr. Chairman, let me remind you that I showed you just such a map in closed session. This array meant that when the military campaign to topple the Taliban and destroy al-Qaeda began last October, we were able to support it with an enormous body of information and a large stable of assets. The realm of human source collection is frequently divided between that which we learn from our foreign partners and unilateral reporting. Even before the plan, our vision for human intelligence on terrorism was simple. We needed to get both from both, more from both types. The amounts of both sources of intelligence rose every year after 1998. And in 1999, for the first time, as I've testified, the volume of reporting on terrorism from our own assets exceeded that from foreign intelligence services, a trend which has continued in subsequent years. The integration of technical and human sources has been key to our understanding of and our actions against international terrorism. It was this combination, this integration, that allowed us years ago to confirm the existence of numerous al-Qaeda facilities and training camps in Afghanistan. On a virtual daily basis, analysts and collection officers from NSA, NEMA, and CIA came together to interactively employ satellite imagery communications information, and human source reporting. The integration also supported military targeting operations before September the 11th and after when it helped provide baseline data for the U.S. Central Command's target planning against al-Qaeda facilities and infrastructure throughout Afghanistan. Even while targeting UBL and al-Qaeda al in their Afghan lair, we did not ignore its cells of terror spread across the globe. We accelerated our work to disrupt and destroy al-Qaeda cells wherever we found them. By 1999, the intensive nature of our operations was disrupting elements of bin Laden's international infrastructure. We went after 
We went after his leaders and pursued terrorists and other groups engaged in planning future attacks. By September 11th, CIA, and in many cases with the FBI, had rendered 70 terrorists to justice around the world. Over a period of months, there was close daily consultation, excuse me, during the millennium period, we told senior policymakers to expect between five and 15 attacks, both here and overseas. The CIA overseas and the FBI in the United States organized an aggressive, integrated campaign to disrupt al-Qaeda's human assets, technical operations, and the handoff of foreign intelligence to facilitate court Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act warrants. Over a period of months, there was close daily consultation that concluded the, the director of the FBI, the National Security Advisor, and the Attorney General. We identified 36 terrorist agents at this time around the world. We pursued operations against them in 50 countries. Our disruption activities succeeded against 21 of these individuals and included terrorist arrests, renditions, detentions, surveillance, and direct approaches. We assisted the Jordanian government in dealing with terrorist cells that planned to attack religious sites and tourist hotels. We helped track down the organizers of these attacks and helped render them to justice. We mounted disruption and arrest operations against terrorists in eight countries on four continents, which netted information that allows us to track down even more suspected terrorists. During this same period, unrelated to the millennium threats. We conducted multiple operations in East Asia, leading to the arrest or detention of 45 members of the Hezbollah network. In December of 1999, an al-Qaeda operative named Rassam was stopped trying to enter the United States from Canada. During the period of the millennium threats, one of our operations and one of our mistakes occurred during our accelerating efforts against bin Laden's organizations when we glimpsed two of the individuals who later became the 9-11 hijackers, Khalid al-Midhar and Nawaf al-Hazmi. In December 1999, CIA, FBI, and the Department of State received intelligence on the travels of suspected al-Qaeda operatives Nawaf and Khalid to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. CIA saw the Kuala Lumpur gathering as a potential source of intelligence about a possible al-Qaeda attack in Southeast Asia. We initiated an operation to learn why those suspected terrorists were traveling to Kuala Lumpur. Khalid and Nawaf were among those travelers who at the time we knew nothing more about them. We arranged to have them surveilled. It is important to note that the origin of the operation was a piece of information the FBI passed to U.S. intelligence in August of 1998. Mr. Chairman, there's a more detailed explanation in the formal statement, but let me walk through the facts. On, 4th of, on the 4th of January, based on intelligence, FBI headquarters, its New York field office, CIA, our counterterrorism center, and stations overseas knew the full name of one of these individuals, Khalid al-Midhar, who intelligence told us all was an individual with possible ties to Osama bin Laden and the Mujahideen in Yemen was traveling to Kuala Lumpur. On the same day, the 4th of January 2000, CIA obtained a photocopy of El Midhar's passport as he traveled to Kuala Lumpur. It showed U.S. multiple entry visa in Jeddah on 7 April 1999 and expiring on 6 April 2000. As the operation was underway, CIA briefed senior FBI counterterrorist officers about its progress. CIA continued to keep the FBI apprised of the results of the operation. On the 5th of January, the CIA officer responsible for initiating and running the operation informed her colleagues at CIA headquarters and abroad in a formal cable that CIA had passed a copy of Al Midhar's passport with its U.S. visa to the FBI for further investigation. I recognize what Ms. Hill said in her opening statement. I can only tell you that I've interviewed this officer. She's a terrific officer. She believes she never would have written this cable unless she believes this had happened. That's as far as we can take that story, and it in no way absolves us of the responsibility for the watch listing, which I will further on complete. The suspected terrorists left Kuala Lumpur before we could learn about what they discussed at the meeting. At the time, we did not know enough about them to assess their significance or the threat they might pose, but we continued to try to learn more. 
In March 2000, a foreign intelligence service told us that Nawaf El Hazmi had flown to Los Angeles a week after the Kuala Lumpur meeting ended. The service did not know that El Midhar was on the same flight. We did not learn that piece of information until August of 2001. As the active phase of the Kuala Lumpur operation ended, CIA suspected that El Midhar was a terrorist and knew he had a visa to enter the United States. Those facts met the State Department's standards for adding his name to its watch list. CIA's lapse in not providing that information to the State Department was caused by a combination of inadequate training of some of our officers, their intense focus on achieving the objectives of the operation itself, determining whether the Kuala Lumpur meeting was a prelude to a terrorist attack, and the extraordinary pace of operational activity at the time. The report that suspected terrorist Nawaf El Hazmi had traveled to the United States also should have triggered, triggered an early effort to notify the State Department and other agencies. However, the information-only message came almost two months after the terrorists left Kuala Lumpur, and no CTC officer involved with the operation recalls seeing the message when it arrived at headquarters. Again, the pace of operations may have been a factor in the missing information. Later in 2000, in the course of supporting FBI's investigation of the attack on the USS Cole, CIA officers looked at the Kuala Lumpur meeting again, but in their focus on the investigation, did not recognize the implications of the information about Al Hazmi and Midhar they had in their files. During August of 2000, Tenet, 21 minutes now. Well, sir, I, I just have to say uh, I've been waiting a year. I've got about another 20 minutes. I, I think I want to put this in the record. It's important. It's Mr. contextual. Chairman, I, it's just, factual. And I'd Mr. like to proceed. Mr. Proceed. Chairman, I would like to hear yeah. the whole story. Yeah, I would, too. During August 2001, <clears throat> CIA had become increasingly concerned about a major terrorist attack on U.S. interests, and I directed a review of our files to identify potential threats. In the course of that review, the Counterterrorism Center found that these two individuals had entered the United States. On August the 23rd, CIA sent a message marked immediate to the Department of State, INS, Customs, and FBI, requesting that they be watchlisted immediately. Before August 2001, CIA should have sent the names of both Hazmi and Midhar to the State Department for inclusion in its watchlist. The error exposed weaknesses in our internal handling of watchlisting, which have been addressed. Corrective steps have been taken. The CIA and the State Department are cooperating to transform the tip-off all-source watch list system into a national watch list center. The center will serve as a point of contact and coordination for all watch lists in the U.S. government. It will also allow us to, pro to process more efficiently the increase in terrorism, intelligence from intelligence and law enforcement agencies. We have increased the managerial review of the system to reduce the chance that watch list opportunities will be missed. We have designed a database and assembled a team to consolidate information on the identities of known and suspected terrorists and to flag any that have not been passed to the proper audience. We have lowered the threshold for nominating individuals for the watch list and clarified that threshold for our officers. We have lowered the threshold of dissemination of information that used to be closely held as operational. Returning to the story of what happened in the run-up run to 9-11, in the months after the millennium period, in October of 2000, we lost a serious battle when the USS Cole was bombed and 17 brave American sailors <coughs> perished. The efforts of American intelligence to strike back at a deadly enemy continued through the Ramadan period in the winter of 2000, another phase of peak threat reporting. Terrorist cells planning attacks against the United States Foreign military and civilian targets in the Persian Gulf were broken up, capturing hundreds of pounds of explosives and other weapons, including anti-aircraft missiles. We succeeded in bringing a major bin Laden terrorist facilitator to justice with the cooperation of two foreign governments. This individual had provided documents and shelter to terrorists traveling throughout the Arabian Peninsula. We worked with numerous European governments, such as the Italians, the Germans, the French, and the British, to identify and break up terrorist groups and plans against American and local interests in Europe. 
Taking the fight to bin Laden and al-Qaeda was not just a matter of mobilizing our counterterrorism center or even CIA. This was an interagency and international effort. Two things which are critical in this effort are fusion and sharing. Counterterrorism Center was created to enable the fusion of all sources of information in a single action-oriented unit. Not only do we fuse every source of information of reporting on terrorists, we fuse analysis and operations. This fusion gives us the speed that we must have to seize fleeting opportunities in the shadowy world of terrorism. Based on this proven philosophy by 2001, the center had more than 30 officers for more than a dozen agencies on board, 10% of its complement at the time. No matter how it is fused within Counterterrorism Center, no matter how large CTC may be, there are still key counterterrorist players outside of it. If you interview anyone today in the Counterterrorism Center, he or she will tell you of the work they are doing with their counterparts across CIA, with NSA, with NEMA, with FBI, or today with a special operations unit in Kandahar or Bagram. It is also clear that when errors occur, when we miss information or opportunities, it is because our sharing and our fusion are not as strong as they need to be. Communication across bureaucracies, missions, and cultures is among our most persistent challenges in the fast-paced, high-pressure environment of counterterrorism. And I will return, this later, return to this may, later in my testimony. One of the most critical alliances in the war against terrorism is that between CIA and FBI. The alliance the last few years has produced achievements that simply would not have been possible if some of the media stories of all-out feuding were true. An FBI officer has been serving as deputy chief of CTC since the mid-90s. An FBI reciprocated by making a CIA officer deputy in the Bureau's counterterrorism division. In the bin Laden issue station itself, FBI officers were detailed there soon after it opened in 1996. Of course, this is not a perfect relationship. Frictions often develop. In 1994, a CIA inspector general noted that the interactions between the two organizations were too personality dependent. This has been particularly so when two were pursuing different missions in the same case the FBI trying to develop a case for courtroom prosecution, the CIA trying to develop intelligence to assess and counter the threat. In 2001, before 9-11, the CIA Inspector General found significant improvement, citing, for example, the center's assistance to the FBI in two dozen renditions in 1999 and 2000. The director of the FBI, Louis Free, and I worked hard and together on this. We had quarterly meetings of our senior leadership teams. Through training and other means, coordination between our chiefs of station and our legats overseas was significantly improved. Today, Bob Mueller and I are working to deepen our cooperation, not only at headquarters, but in the field. We both understand that despite different missions and cultures, we need to build a system of seamless cooperation that is institutionalized. Mr. Chairman, the third period is the run-up period to 9-11. As with the millennium and Ramadan 2000 periods, we increased the tempo of our operations against al-Qaeda. We stopped some attacks and caused terrorists to postpone others. We helped to break up another terrorist cell in Jordan and seized a large quantity of weapons, including rockets and high explosives. Working with another partner, we broke up a plan to attack U.S. facilities in Yemen. In June, CIA worked with a Middle East partner to arrest two bin Laden operatives planning attacks on U.S. facilities in Saudi Arabia. In June and July, CIA launched a wide-ranging disruption effort against bin Laden's organization with targets in almost two dozen countries. Our intent was to drive up bin Laden's security concerns and lead his organization to delay or cancel its attacks. We subsequently received reporting that attacks were delayed including an attack against the U.S. military in Europe. In July, a different Middle East partner helped bring about the detention of a terrorist who had been directed to begin an operation to an attack an American embassy or cultural center in a European capital. In the summer of 2001, local authorities acting on our information arrested an operative described as bin Laden's man in East Asia. 
We assisted another foreign partner in the rendition of a senior bin Laden associate. Information he provided included plans to kidnap Americans in three countries and carry out hijackings. We provided intelligence to a Latin American service on a band of terrorists considering hijackings and bombings. An FBI team detected explosives residue in their hotel rooms. In the months leading up to 9-11, we were convinced that bin Laden meant to attack Americans, meant to kill in large numbers, and that the attack could be at home, abroad, or both. And we reported these threats urgently. Our collection sources lit up during this intense period. They indicated that multiple spectacular attacks were planned and that some of these plots were in the final stages. Some of the reporting implicated known al-Qaeda operatives. The reports suggested that the targets were American, although some reporting simply pointed to the West or to Israel. But the reporting was maddeningly, maddeningly short on actionable details. The most ominous reporting hinting at something large was also most vague. The only occasions in this reporting where there was specific geographic context, either explicit or implicit, it appeared to point abroad, especially to the Middle East. We disseminated these raw reports immediately and widely to policymakers and action agencies such as the military, the State Department, the FAA, the FBI, and others. The reporting by itself stood as a dramatic warning of imminent attack. Our analysis worked to find linkages among the reports, as well as links to past terrorist threats and tactics. We considered whether Al-Qaeda was feeding us this reporting, trying to create panic through disinformation. Yet we concluded that the plots were real. When some reporting hinted that an attack had been delayed, we continued to stress that where indeed multiple attacks planned and that several continued on track. And when we grew concerned that so much of the evidence pointed to attacks overseas, we noted that bin Laden's principal ambition had long been to strike the United States. Nevertheless, with regard to the 9-11 plot, we never acquired the level of detail that allowed us to translate our strategic concerns into something that we could act on. The Intelligence Community Counterterrorism Board issued several reports that summer. A sign that our warnings were being heard both from our analysis and from the raw intelligence we disseminated was that the FAA issued two alerts to air carriers in the summer of 2001. Our warnings complemented strategic warnings that we've been delivering for years about the real threat of terrorism to America. There's no need to go through it, but you know, Mr. Chairman, in three separate occasions in my worldwide threat testimony, I told you that as I told you in 1999, there is not the slightest doubt that Osama bin Laden, his worldwide allies, and his sympathizers are planning further attacks against us. I told you he will strike whenever in the world he thinks we are vulnerable, and that we were concerned that one or more of bin Laden's attacks could occur at any time. In 2001, I told you that the terrorists are seeking out softer targets that provide opportunities for mass casualties and that bin Laden is capable of planning multiple attacks with little or no warning. I looked at the strategic warnings that had been issued on hijacked aircrafts. Earlier in the 1990s, we had some serious strategic analytical work on both terrorist targets and methodology. A national intelligence estimate in 1995 warned, the United States is particularly vulnerable to various types of terrorist attacks. Several kinds of targets are especially at risk. National symbols such as the White House, the Capitol, and symbols of U.S. capitalism such as Wall Street, power grids, communication switch switches, particularly civil aviation. The same estimate also said we also assess that civil aviation will figure prominently among possible terrorist targets in the United States. This stems from the increasing domestic threat posed by the foreign terrorists, the continuing appeal of civil aviation as a target, and a domestic aviation security system that has been the focus of media attention. We have evidence that individuals linked to terrorist groups or state sponsors have attempted to penetrate security at U.S. airports in recent years. The media have called attention to, among other things, inadequate security for checked baggage. A review of the evidence obtained thus far about the plot uncovered in Manila in early 1995 suggests the conspirators were guided in their selection of the method and venue of attack 
by carefully studying security procedures in place in the region. If terrorists operating in this country are similarly methodical, they will identify serious vulnerabilities in our security system of domestic flights. In a 1997 update, we said pretty much the same thing. It's clear that the message was received. The White House Commission on Aviation Safety and Security noted a number of facts consistent with this in their report, which you have in the record. In its publication, Criminal Acts Against Civil Aviation, 2000, the FAA, the FAA stated, although bin Laden is not known to have attacked civil aviation, he has both the motivation and the wherewithal to do so. Bin Laden's anti-Western and anti-American attitudes make him and his followers a significant threat to civil aviation, especially U.S. civil aviation. We have given you over a half a million pages of documents and interviewed hundreds of intelligence officers in their efforts to investigate this complex issue. The documents we provided show some 12 reports spread over seven years which pertain to possible use of aircraft as terrorist weapons. We disseminated those reports to the appropriate agencies, such as the FAA, the Department of Transportation, and the FBI, as they came in. We, moreover, we also provided versions of intelligence reports that were, war that were about threats to civil aviation so they could be distributed more widely through the airline industry. Mr. Chairman, I want to talk about two more subjects, and I appreciate the fact that you're letting me go on. Budget and resources. Mrs. Pelosi, you were, you were right. No one should hide behind budget and resources as an excuse for anything. But there's a context of budget and resources that is important for us to evaluate. To evaluate our work, it is essential that you look at three issues. Global geopolitical issues we were grappling with, counterterrorism, resource changes throughout the 1990s that affected our ability to fight, and the overall health of U.S. intelligence during this period. It is simply not enough to look at al-Qaeda in isolation. The last decade saw a number of conflicting and competing trends. Military forces deployed to more locations than ever in our country's history. A growing counterproliferation and counterterrorism threat. Constant tensions in the Middle East and to deal with these and a host of other issues. Far fewer intelligence dollars and manpower. At the end of the Cold War, the intelligence community with a $300 billion deficit and budget caps much like the rest of the national security community, was asked by both Congress and successive administrations to pay the peace dividend. The cost of the dividend was that during the 1990s, the intelligence community funding declined in real terms, reducing our buying power by tens of billions of dollars over the decade. This loss of people was devastating, particularly in our two most manpower-intensive activities, all source analysis and human source collection, by the mid-1990s, recruitment of CIA analysts and case officers had come to a virtual halt. NSA was hiring no new technologists during the greatest information technology change in our lifetime. During this period, it was the exception that we would surge, expectation that we would surge our existing resources to deal with emerging intelligence challenges, including threats from terrorism, and surge we did. As I declared war on al-Qaeda in 1998, in the aftermath of the East Africa bombings, we were in the fifth year of round-the-clock support to Operation Southern Watch. Just three months earlier, we were embroiled in answering questions on the India-Pakistan nuclear tests and trying to determine how we could surge more people to understanding and countering weapons of mass destruction. In early of 1999, we surged more than 800 analysts and redirected collection assets to support the NATO bombing campaign against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. During this time period of increased military operations, the Defense Department was also reducing its tactical intelligence units and funding. This caused the intelligence community to stretch our capabilities because national systems were covering the gaps in tactical intelligence. While we grappled with this multitude of high priority and overlapping crises, we had no choice but to modernize selective intelligence systems and infrastructure in which we deferred necessary investments while we downsized or we would have found ourselves out of business. We had a vivid example of the cost of deferring investments a few years ago when NSA lost all communications between the headquarters and its field stations and were unable to process that information for several days. Throughout the intelligence community during those peri this period, 
we made difficult resource allocation decisions to try to rebuild critical mission areas. In CIA, we launched a program to rebuild our clandestine service. This meant overhauling our recruitment and training practices and our infrastructure. We launched similar initiatives to rebuild our analytical depth and expertise and to reacquire the cutting edge in technology. Although we will not be given credit for these efforts in the war on terrorism, they most assuredly contributed to that effort. NSA made the hard decision to cut additional positions to free up pay and benefit dollars to patch critical infrastructure problems and to modestly attempt to capitalize on the technology revolution. But with the Al-Qaeda threat growing more ominous and with our resources devoted to countering the threat clearly inadequate, we began taking money, more money and people away from other critical areas to improve our efforts against terrorism. We managed to triple the intelligence community-wide funding for counterterrorism from the per period of 1990 to 1999. The Counterterrorism Center's resources nearly quadrupled in the same period. As your own joint inquiry staff charts show, we had significantly reallocated both dollars and people inside our programs to work the terrorism problem. Inside CIA, the 90s reflect the same pattern. CIA's budget had declined in 18 percent, and we'd lost 16 percent of our personnel. Yet in the midst of the stark resource picture, our funding level for counterterrorism just prior to 9-11 was 50 percent higher than our 1997 level. CTC personnel increased by over 60 percent during the same period. The CIA consistently reallocated and sought additional resources in this fight. In fact, in 1994, the budget request for counterterrorism equal less than 4 percent of our program total. In the fiscal 2002 budget request we submitted prior to 9-11, counterterrorism activities constituted almost 10 percent of the budget increase. During a period of budget stringency, when we were faced with rebuilding essential intelligence capabilities, I made some tough choices. And although resources for virtually everything else at CIA was going down, counterterrorism resources went up. After the U.S. embassies in Africa were bombed, we requested more money. In the fall of 1998, I asked the administration to increase intelligence funding by more than $2 billion annually for the fiscal years 2000 to 2005, and each, in an each subsequent FIDA program, I made similar requests. Only small portions of these requests were approved. Counterterrorism funding and manpower needs were number one in every list I provided to Congress and the administration. Indeed, it was at the top of the funding list for approved by Speaker Gingrich in 1999, the first year in which we received a significant infusion of new money for intelligence. That supplemental and those that follow it that you supplied were essential to our efforts and they helped save American lives. We knew we could not count on supplementals to build multi-year programs, and that's why we've worked so hard to reallocate our resources and seek five-year funding increases. Many of you on this committee and the appropriations committees understood the problem very well. You were enormously helpful to us, and we are grateful. I want to conclude on the resource point by saying one thing. In CIA alone, I count the equivalent of over 700 officers working counterterrorism in August of 2001 at both headquarters in the field. The number does not include the people who are working to penetrate, either technically or through human sources, a multitude of terrorist targets which we could drive intelligence, intelligence on terrorists. Nor does it include friendly liaison services or coalition partners. You simply cannot gauge the level of effort by counting only people who had the words Al-Qaeda or bin Laden in their position description. We reallocated all the people we could, and we always knew that we never had enough. We can argue for the rest of the day about the exact number of people we had working this problem, but what we never said was that the numbers we had were enough. enough. Our officers told your investigators that they were always shorthanded. They were right. They were. America may never know the names of those officers, but America should know they are heroes. They worked tirelessly for years to combat bin Laden and al-Qaeda and have responded to the challenge of combating terrorism all during this time with remarkable intensity. Their dedication, professionalism, and creativity 
stop many al-Qaeda plots in their tracks, and save countless American lives. Most of them are still in this fight, are essential to this fight, and they honor all of us by their continued service. Let me close with some points, Mr. Chairman. Success against terrorist targets must be measured against all elements of our nation's capabilities, policies, and will. The intelligence community and the FBI are important parts of the equation, but by no means the only parts. We need a national integrated strategy in our fight against terrorism that incorporates both offense and defense. The strategy must be based on three pillars. Continued relentless effort to penetrate terrorist groups, whether by human or technical means, whether in loan or in partnership with others. Intelligence, military, law enforcement, and diplomacy must stay on the offense continually against terrorism around the world. We must disrupt and destroy the terrorist operational chain of command and the momentum to deny them sanctuary anywhere and eliminate their sources of financial and logistical support. Nothing did more for our ability to combat terrorism than the President's decision to send us into the terrorist sanctuary. By going in massively, we were able to change the rules for the terrorists. Now they are the hunted. Now they have to spend their time worrying about their survival. Al-Qaeda must never again acquire a sanctuary anywhere. On defense, we need systematic security improvements to protect our country. On defense, we need systematic security improvements to protect our country, country's people and our infrastructure and create a more difficult operating environment here in the United States for terrorists. The objective is to understand our vulnerabilities better than the terrorists do, to take action to reduce those vulnerabilities, to increase the costs and risks for terrorists to operate in the United States, and over time make those costs unacceptable to them. We have learned an important historic lesson. We can no longer race from threat to threat, resolve it, disrupt it, and then move on. Targets at risk remain at risk. In 1993, the first attack on the World Trade Center was damaging, maybe modestly so compared, but nevertheless very damaging. A plot around the same time to attack New York City tunnels and landmarks was broken up. We all breathed a sigh of relief and moved on, focusing <coughs> the effort mostly on bringing the perpetrators to justice. The terrorists came back. At the millennium, a young terrorist panicked at a Canadian-U.S. border crossing, and his plan to attack an airport in Los Angeles was exposed and thwarted. We breathed another sigh of relief and prepared for his trial. Al-Qaeda's plans had only been delayed. Last winter, another young terrorist on an airliner ineptly tried to detonate explosives in his shoes and was stopped by alert crew and passengers. At this point, we're smarter. We started checking people's shoes for explosives. It's not nearly enough. In the last year, we have gone on high alert several times for good reason, only to have no attack occur. We all breathed a sigh of relief and thought maybe it was a false alarm. It wasn't. We must design systems that reduce both the chances of an attack of getting through and the impact if it does. We must address both the threat and our vulnerability. We must not allow ourselves mentally to move on while the enemy is still at large. Two final points. Our people need better ways to communicate. Moreover, we also need systems that enable us to share critical information quickly across bureaucratic boundaries. Systems to put our intelligence in front of those who need it wherever, wherever they may be, whatever their specific responsibilities for protecting the American people from the threat of terrorist attack. This means we must move information in ways and to places it never had to move before. We are improving our collaborative systems. We need to improve our multiple communications links, both within the intelligence community and now to Homeland Security. Now more than ever before, we need to make sure our customers get from us exactly what they need, which generally means exactly what they want, fast and free of unnecessary restrictions. Chiefs of police across the country express understandable frustration at what they do not know. But there's something else. Intelligence officers in the federal government want to get their hands on locally collected data. Each could often use what the other may have already collected. The proposed Department of Homeland Security will help. 
so too will the intelligence communities experience in supporting our armed forces. We're going to have to put that experience to work in supporting the police chiefs. We don't have the luxury of an alternative. This fight is going to be long and difficult. It will require the patience and the diligence that the President has asked for. It will require resources sustained over a multi-year period to recapitalize our intelligence infrastructure on a pace that matches the changing technical and operational environment that we face. It will also require countries that have previously ignored the problem of terrorism or refused to cooperate with us to step up and choose sides. It will require all of us across the government to follow the example of the American people after September 11th, to come, to come together to work as a team and pursue our mission with unyielding dedication and unrelenting fidelity to our highest ideals. We owe those who died on September 11th and all Americans no less.